had um, uh, less than flattering views about Revelation. Martin Luther, as important as he was in the, launching the whole Protestant movement, Martin Luther said the Revelation should be thrown out of the New Testament. Jerome, you remember Jerome? Now you got to go back to our early days of understanding the Bible and translations. Ooh, I'm taking you all the way back to September now. But Jerome was the one who translated the Bible into Latin that was known as the Vulgate. Okay. There we go. If we had a final exam, that kind of thing would be on it. Aren't you glad there is no final exam in this class? Oh, yeah. Ah. So, Jerome, who translated into Latin called the Vulgate, Jerome said, Revelation has as many mysteries as it does words. Now, some of us who have read through Revelation might kind of uh, understand that. And John Calvin, who was quite a theologian who launched the whole movement that today we call the Reform Movement in Christianity, he wrote a commentary on every book in the New Testament, except one. <laughs> and he chose not to write on Revelation. So, I would say Revelation is the most under, uh, misunderstood, most misused, and most mispronounced book in the Bible. Now you probably think, well, I get that misunderstood and misused. How is it mispronounced? Revelations. There we go. There is no S. There is no S on Revelation. And it, it, it's to me that's a little bit like uh, you know fingernails on a on a blackboard. And people talk about revelations. Well, no, it's it's revelation or the revelation, and and therefore I think even though it's a simple word to say, it is often mispronounced in uh, the way we use it. So what's the word in Greek? Apocalypse. Okay. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. So, so that is also the word that is used, and uh, that's the first word in the book, in the Greek, apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me try to describe Revelation using stories from two famous battles. One at the beginning, one at the end. First was the Battle of New Orleans. I don't remember that, Andrew Jackson fame. What was the distinctive thing about that battle? Battle of New Orleans was fought after the treaty had been signed to end the War of 1812. So it was a battle that was fought, but the war was over. Now, it was the Treaty of Ghent that had been signed over in Europe. It took a little while across the sea, you know, to get the, the treaty back over here and word to the United States and to get it ratified. And, and therefore, uh, that's the reason for the delay. But the Battle of New Orleans is famous for uh, being fought even after the war was over. So the book of Revelation, I think, tells the story of the battles that continue. But the war is over. God has won. In fact, if you want to cut through all the fog and mystery and, and uh, misunderstanding sometimes of Revelation, simple message is God wins. God has won through Jesus Christ. And, and the battle continues. And that's some of the turmoil you read about in Revelation. But the... Uh, proclamation, the good news of it is God has already won. And that happened when Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead. And we'll we'll talk about how all that is, is described. But uh, I think of the Battle of New Orleans. And, and in some sense, we're still fighting that battle, good and evil, you know, all the struggles <clears throat> in life. It continues, but the good news is 
the victory has been won. And that day will come when we can fully live into that victory. So, Revelation. Can, can I, this is relevant but not relevant. <laughs> Louisiana Purchase was in 1803. Right. What did the War of 1812 in New Orleans have to do with it at that point in 1812? Right. Well, you know, the War of 1812, we were fighting the British again. Mm -hmm. And and uh, my memory of the, the battle part, the British wanted to try to come around and kind of enter into New Orleans and come up the underside of of American forces uh, instead of just attacking directly mm -hmm. uh, more around the eastern seaboard, mm -hmm. which had failed for them. And so it kind of in one last gasp, if we could go make an mm -hmm. end run around the defenses mm -hmm. and come up through, and of course, if you get New Orleans and then you can come up the river, mm -hmm. okay, but Andrew Jackson held them off and, and we won, but the war was actually over. But that was a part of the United States at mm -hmm. that point yeah. because of the Louisiana Purchase. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Now, if someone knows more about that kind of American history than me, correct me to him later. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's my name. So who wrote Revelation? Well, a man named John. Okay, so which John? You know. So John, being a common name, uh, there was John the Apostle, uh, James and John, sons of Zebedee. We talked about him before. There was a John, uh, likely an elder or presbyter in Ephesus. And there was John Mark, you know, who we believe uh, wrote Mark. Or, or there might have been a John, it's a common name, who, who was not really one of these, what we know about John is that he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And, and this exile was a part of a Christian persecution. So it doesn't greatly matter in understanding Revelation, which John this was. Although in New Testament scholarship, I had mentioned <laughs> Earlier, you have the Gospel of John, you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and you have Revelation written by them. All of those are grouped together to be called Johannine literature. That's just a good fancy word for written by John, whether it was the same person or, or a community that built up, especially around the Apostle John. Um, we just really don't know, but a man named John was exiled to Patmos, and there he was he was in this exile because of the context. So, so getting back to our earlier question, so what was going on that would lead to the writing of this book? We really think Revelation was written from about, you know, a period of time from about 81 to around 96 AD somewhere in that 15 year period. Domitian was the Roman emperor. And Domitian was one who, who began to um, insist that he was divine, that he be called Lord. And if you would not bow down and call him Lord in a divine way, um, then persecution happened. That's really why one of the earliest Christian affirmations, <clears throat> just the very simplest, you know, what do you believe? Jesus is Lord. In other words, not Domitian, not any emperor. Jesus is Lord. But Domitian did not like that. And, and so all of the the stories that we know about, the, the persecution and, and Christians uh, thrown to the lions and all that, that began happening during this era. So you have a church under fire in terrible times. 
And this letter was written to try to encourage this church and strengthen this church at a time of, of extreme persecution, danger, threat. That's important to know. Well, we don't know if it was a letter or a sermon. I had a New Testament professor in the seminary, Dr. Blevins, who thought it was originally a drama. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting, but, but you can kind of see the way it's laid out, he, the different acts, and, and how it might have been presented as drama for people to get this message, times are tough, mm -hmm. God wins, okay? Now, because of all of this persecution, we need to go back to something we learned when we were talking about Daniel. And that is um, where we talked about apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic. So I already said that the, the first word in Greek in this book of Revelation is apocalypsis, apocalypsis. Our word apocalypse obviously comes from there. But apocalyptic literature really began um, in Judaism around kind of from a, a period of time of about 250 BC up to about 100 AD, that period of time. And there it was, the bad guys were not necessarily people like the mission, but I mentioned when we studied Daniel, it was people like Antiochus Epiphanes coming in and, and wreaking havoc in Jerusalem. And so what they did, first the Jews <laughs> and then the Christians, they used a code. We call it an apocalyptic code. It's made up of symbols, symbols that are numbers or animals or colors that mean something. And you can understand this. Uh, in wartime, <laughs> we used code so that the, that I guess we still do all the time, not just in war. We don't want, you know, the other, whoever the bad guys are currently, we don't want them knowing what we're thinking. So you, you speak in code. <clears throat> well, that developed during this period, which was, uh, at the late end of what we call the Old Testament and then the intertestamental period. But Revelation is written, almost all of it, in this apocalyptic code. So if, if you get into it and they're just all these numbers and colors and beasts, frogs, and you know, all this, uh, <clears throat> that's okay. You need to understand the code. So if you'll turn your outline over, I just, I'm giving you the code. So from now on, you can fully understand Revelation. Um, and some of these things make sense. You've run into them before. The number code. So seven, that's God's number. That's divine. Seven days of creation, for example. Um, well, Shabbat, Sabbath is from mm -hmm. Shabbat, which is number seven. Exactly, mm -hmm. on the seventh day. Um, if seven is God, then six mm -hmm. it is imperfection. You know, it's less than that. And if you were to ever put three sixes together, mm -hmm. <laughs> six, 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 you see. Um, ten is completeness. Uh, 12 is kind of a fullness. So even going back to Israel, 12 tribes, that was the wholeness of Israel. 10 commandments, for example. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, and then fractions would be incomplete. So as we go along, we will see there were a number of places where there were seven, which there were seven lampstands, there were seven seals, there were seven this and that. Um, this is all representing that's God's number. Colors mm -hmm. also are are used. 
things like pale green meaning death and dark green meaning light. But you can see where that comes from. When, when a person dies, you know, there's a paleness to the skin. But if you look outside and just look, there you see the dark green vibrant leaves that represent the new life of spring. So uh, even they go all the way down to scarlet under the color code. Did you have to read the mm -hmm. scarlet letter in high school? I did. Well, you put that scarlet letter on you, and you know that was a symbol of immorality. Okay, and then an animal code: the lamb. That's Jesus, but a frog is is evil. Okay, so um, and beasts mm -hmm. are extremely evil, such as Caesar, Satan. You know, we we have these beasts showing up. So hold on to the code as you read through Revelation because it can start to make a little more sense to you if you know what the people likely would have known because whether it was a drama or a letter or a sermon, it was spoken or written in such a way that the Romans who were already oppressing and persecuting so that they would not uh, intercept the message and, and make things even worse. The apocalyptic code. What amazes me is today, people are using this. You hear your friends. I mean, seven appears a lot of the eagle. Um, right. I, I didn't know what all that was. when, the, And then I started to learn about it. Then it became what people believe this, and there. What is the group called? There's a um, there's a cluster group of people, even here in Winston, that adhere to this and believe that mm -hmm. uh, re revelation is coming, mm -hmm. right. the Lord is coming, but they right. use all of this. I, mm -hmm. so, so, so these symbols mm -hmm. they continue, <clears throat> but that that brings me to my, the next thing I'm saying. So, how do we interpret all this? So, and, and here's where it gets so interesting with Revelation because, because it is so symbolic in, in all this code, it has been interpreted in, in various ways throughout all of Christian history. And, and let me just, let me mention three examples. One is seeing or reading Revelation and interpreting that everything that's written, all the prophecies, everything there was about stuff that happened in the past. So, so when we um, start reading uh, Revelation, chapter one, verse one, it says that these things are revealed. What must soon take place? So soon take place. So one interpretation is that all of this, these struggles, these tribulations, battles, all that is, is now in the past. It was a part of Christians and Romans, and it was um, the struggle that happened in that early century. We can learn from it, but it's it's all seen as past tense. A fancy word for this kind of interpretation, this is the preterist, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T, preterist. In other words, pre, it's, it's something that's before, it's already happening. Sort of an opposite interpretation is everything in Revelation, it hasn't happened yet, it is, it's all about the future. So every prophecy and all of these, you know, battles and whatever, they haven't happened back in Roman days. They are going to happen at some time in the future. And that's some of maybe what some of these groups are, are talking about, because throughout Christian history, there have been people who have who had read Revelation <laughs> and tried to interpret, okay, Armageddon, let's take that as an example, is going to happen such and such a time. 
um, uh, they've tried to interpret concepts of millennia. So, you know, a thousand year reign, does that happen before Christ comes, after Christ comes, or, or not? So all of these debates, but that is all, all about the future, okay? So I, we just don't have time to go into all of that. I, I once spent 10 weeks teaching Revelation and, and still just scratched the surface, you know, in less than an hour, can't go into all that today. But I want you to know that some people read it and interpret it, nothing's happened yet, all about the future. Some people read it, it's all happened back in Roman times. It's the past. Uh, what, what's that belief based on, or what documentation do they use to support that theory? So that a, um, a revelation, you know, they just start with the first verse. So to start, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So in other words, this revelation came to the servants of God, the Christians, mm -hmm. um, to see what was going to happen soon. In their struggle, in, in their time, mm -hmm. So if you read then the, like the beasts and, you know, these different animals, and so forth, that's, that's about Roman oppression because that's where, that was the context the people were in. And, and it was prophecy, but it was not prophecy like for thousands of years later. It was prophecy about how God was going to see them through that time. So it was prophecy a uh, hundred years prior to this being written. Um, well, no, it was prophecy coming out of this revelation that John experienced that he writes about in okay. chapter one. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so let me offer the third option because that's where I come in. Uh, because you really have two extremes. It's all about the past, what happened in the past. Or it's all about the future, what's going to happen. A third option is sometimes called the historical interpretation, which means, yes, this was written about that context of persecution in Roman times. It was written to Christians who were who were being persecuted <clears throat> and killed. So it was very much about that day. <clears throat> but like a lot of scripture like the prophets in the Old Testament, like Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and all that, what was written for their time also is a timeless word from God. So we have been having struggles and trials and persecutions, not just in Roman days, up to this very day. And so the historical view says, <clears throat> let's read Revelation as... Uh, what happened in the Roman context, but also what's happened all throughout history, history, mm -hmm. but also what is going to happen at the end of time. You see the difference? It's mm -hmm. it really is about the the victory of God that <clears throat> is is evident that comes through the whole scope of history. And to use my New Orleans battle analogy you know the battle keeps on waging and it's been waging all throughout history forces of good and evil and all these things that wasn't just in roman times it's not just in the end times it's it's all time. but we can mm -hmm. still uh affirm and proclaim the message that god is mm -hmm. what we want and and we do have to live out these struggles or battles but we can do so with hope, great hopefulness, because of, of the fact that God is one. So to me, that third approach of historical it acknowledges, well, it was written in a context that had Christians struggling and in trouble. It is about what is to come, but... Um, it 
also has meaning for us here. So to relegate revelation just to deep in the past or at somewhere out in the future misses how it might really speak to us right now this week in our lives. And, and that's why I, I go with the uh, historical. So let's walk through the book quickly. And, and let me just point out a few things. What I've done is put down an outline. And, um, and that's really how I'll need to just touch on it in outline fashion. But I hope if you've ever gotten bogged down in Revelation and just totally confused, as a lot of people have, and they've said to me, I don't even want to read it, <laughs> you know. I hope maybe a, a summary look, a 30,000 foot look, where you can see sort of the whole scope of the book might make more sense. And then you can take this code and you can dig in and, and read on your own later. So it starts with a prologue, chapter one. And, and in this prologue, John introduces himself and says, you know, I was caught up in this vision, this ecstatic, holy, visionary kind of experience that um, a lot of folks would say, I've never had such a thing. Others might say they had. But what it was, it was a vision that revealed to him this message from God. And the word apocalypse, apocalypse, it means unveiling, unveiling. So revelation, same same word, or apocalypse means unveiling. So this this man John, who was exiled, he has this experience in which God unveils to him um, this message of hope. I would say. <clears throat> Chapters two and three are a, a section in which there are seven letters, letters to seven churches that were known in that area. Um, letters from the Lord to those churches. Um, mm -hmm. I know some pastors who've been asked by their congregation, would you ask, would you reach through Revelation? They didn't really want to do all of that, but, but a seven-week series on the letters to the seven churches um, really focuses on this message of Christ to the churches uh, without getting too much into the the code and the beast and the violence and all of that, it's a part of revelation that some people hold on to and preach about and talk about more than other parts. Um, and these letters to the churches, it's so amazing, it describes the churches and what they were like then, but those same characteristics are going on in our churches today. You know, so 2,000 years later, the letters are just as relevant for us, and it's just like the letters of Paul. He wrote to specific situations in churches, um, but still, we're wrestling with those same kind of things today. So these letters to the seven churches are, are powerful, but not quite as mysterious because they're, they're written to these churches. Then in chapters four and five, we start to get visions of, of heaven. Certainly, Revelation is a book that if you want to try to begin understanding what heaven is like, Revelation is a good place to, to start. And remember, if you're talking to people who are struggling, who don't know if they're going to live, you know, to the end of the week, then some picture of the life that is to come is comforting and brings hope. 
that's what those chapters are about, trying to point them to a better day and, and the words tell them about that. But you know, we, we sing about that. I, I thought about in our country about slaves who as they did that terrible slave work, many of them sang and they sang and their songs often were about their struggles, but they were also often about, you know, life over Jordan. And, and so they were able to uh, um, live with the struggle of today because of that vision of tomorrow. I'm watching right now. I'm late because it's been out several years, but I'm watching Ken Burns' documentary on country music. Mm -hmm. Anybody seen that? Uh, it's fascinating. I, I've never really been a big country music fan, except for Johnny Cash. <laughs> uh, but how much of country music and country gospel came out of the poor, hard scrabble existence, whether it be in the mountains of Appalachia or you know the Dust Bowl out west or whatever, and and yet they sang and that. Um, singing, you, you know, could lift them to out of the struggle, but some glad morning, you know, some glad morning, uh, we'll all what, fly away. Mm -hmm. fly away. And, and then we'll know the sweet by and by. That, that's what Revelation 4 and 5 was trying to help the folks live with their struggles by looking and catching a glimpse of heaven. Now, you might call it escapism, but, but I would call it um, giving them powerful groundings in hopefulness. You really can struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's still... We had a tragedy, and I know that that was one thing in my life that really affected me was what you're saying. Is there hope or is this an escape from, to forget what, right. to understand, rationalize what happened? Right, mm -hmm. right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's turmoil. It is a turmoil. And frank, frankly, you say it well. This whole book is a turmoil. Mm -hmm. and you just read it as you read the struggles going on. But I hope that we see as we move through the arc of the book that the turmoil ends in victory. And that's the message, you know, because uh, there was no denying for these early Christians, or as I would say with the historical view, for all of us, there's no denying the real struggles of life. And um, Revelation seeks to speak to those struggles. So then we move in chapter six through eight. Uh, we, we start hearing about the seven things. The first is the seven seals, you know, that are going to be opened up. And there we we meet what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> Ever heard of that before? Um, years ago, there were there were famous running backs at the University of Notre Dame called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. That's not what this is. Mm -hmm. But um, conquest, war, famine, and death. And my point is, they had that back in Roman days, obviously. We've had that ever since. That will be in the future. But the, these are some of the great catastrophes of human history that are described. That's chapter 6 through 8. And then, 8 through 11, the seven trumpets start blowing. You see the number, this divine number, and plagues come. Woes to the unbelievers, but victories to the saints. And then in chapters 12 to 14, you have these seven conflict visions. They're battles of good versus evil. The battles continue. In the seven bowl plagues, chapters 15 and 16. Victory cannot come until the great woes have occurred. Um, and 
There's no way to avoid the struggle that is written there. Chapter 16, verse 16 is where there's a mention of Armageddon. Some translations will even say Armageddon or Armageddon. Um, likely a reference to the valley of Megiddo. I have stood in that valley. And that's where in, in the history of Israel, there had been a number of battles in this valley of Megiddo. So it's not some place way up in the sky necessarily. You know, it had been a battlefield, just like in our country, if we say Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. do, do you think battlefield? All right. If you say Megiddo or Armageddon, you think battlefield. So the struggle continues, but in chapters 17 through 20, the final victory of the Lamb. And there's this, this powerful picture of the Lamb who is Jesus, right? Yeah. This, this Lamb who comes and, and um, experiences the final victory, conquest. And I, I can just imagine if this uh, was first presented as a drama, and just imagine the people watching and it's you've had all the wars fighting on the stage and it, it comes to life in my mind as a drama. And then in the end where the lamb comes in and, and uh, wins, you, you can just almost here, the Christians who understand the symbolism taking hope in that. And then the last two chapters, the vision of heaven. Chapters 21 and 22, a new heaven and a new earth. In my ministry, I, I often turn to these chapters in funerals. Um, Chapter 22, which is the last chapter, is um, this beautiful picture of a garden. And in the garden, there, there's this river, and there are all these trees, and the, the fruit of the trees are for the healing of the nations. And, and you see this, <clears throat> this grand arc of the story of God. Where did it all start for us back in September? It started in a, in a garden. Where does it end? Ends in a garden. And, and there is this symmetry to it all that uh, what God began as a paradise that then was ruptured by sin and evil. And then you have the whole human history, but it's going to end and there's going to be this river and the tree of life. And there's going to be healing for the nations. It's a beautiful picture for everyone who knew, especially the, the account of the garden beginning to see how it ends in a garden. Revelation is also the story of Jesus. Jesus came, revealed himself to us, the mm -hmm. unveiled God to us. You know, there's, that's what the incarnation is. Jesus came. But Jesus had to endure tribulation and suffering. And that was the cross. And out of that came the victory of the resurrection. And so you have this this um, story of Jesus, but what Revelation is about, well, it's that same story. God revealing, God entering the struggles of human life, God bringing about victory uh, against evil. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. The story that is the story of Jesus, it's the story of Scripture. I hope we can see on this in these last few moments, how well that's what we've been talking about all year. You know, in the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, that's what we've been talking about the whole time. So I began with the Battle of New Orleans. Let me end with another battle. One of my 
favorite stories I usually tell around Easter. It's the Battle of Waterloo. So Waterloo, who was who was fighting on the French side? Napoleon was the leader. On the English side, Wellington was the leader. Key battle for Europe. Uh, battle of Waterloo. And it was fought over on the, the mainland, not in England. So when the battle was over, the word needed to be brought back to England um, about what happened. But there was a little delay. You, no way to send, make a phone call or anything. You had to send a ship. The ship would then use flags, <clears throat> semaphore, you know, flag signals to signal the message. And, and the ship comes and then the plan was they were going to have sentinels and fires on the mountaintops that would send the message all throughout England. And the message came, the first word that was went up the flag, Wellington. Second word was defeated. And then the fog came in. The, the fog that England is known so well for, the ship was covered and it seemed like that was all the message. Wellington defeated. And that message began to make its way around the Wellington defeated. And then after some hours, the fog lifted and the rest of the flags were hoisted. Wellington defeated the enemy. <clears throat> and there was great jubilation and victory. And to me, that is the Easter story because on Good Friday, it certainly looked like Jesus defeated. Even his friends and followers. Probably. Mm -hmm. But then the message of Easter, Jesus defeated death. Well, that's what Revelation is about. The battle continues, but the, the war is over. And sometimes the fog gets in the way, and we don't get the whole message, but the whole message is that God wins. And so this, this great book written in this mysterious code offers this wonderful message, Jesus defeated the enemy. And the very last book, last verse in Revelation, the last verse in the Bible says this, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Yeah. And so that is my last word to you. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Yeah. What do we need to talk about? Got just a couple of minutes. David, yeah. um, I find Revelation even book of hope. Yes, absolutely. We can get caught up in all the things and not just that. But a verse that has bothered me for a while is in chapter 20, and my saints go back to the church. That listens to me. Chapter 20, verse 7. And this is when Satan is Christ. Just now, when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from this prison and will go out and deceive the nations between the four corners of the earth. And I can make God gather them together to battle, whose number is as of the sand of the sea. To that, to think that Satan's army will be as of the sand of the sea just tears in my soul. Yes. What we think. There's no work left to be done. How can, how can we impact that? Yes. I think that's a very powerful purpose yes. for us as present day followers. Yes. I mean, I think about that within my own family who, who may be lost. It's awful. Yes. So, as you say, it's a book of hopefulness. So to me, that verse says there's still a lot of work to do, and and the battle keeps going. But if we also keep reading to the very end, even though as numerous as the sands of the sea, 
um, God is victorious. And to me, that is where the hopefulness comes. Yeah. Uh, rather than stopping, if we had just stopped right there, well, that's too much. We can't can't go, but we keep going with the good news. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Everybody understand the revelation now? Oh, yeah. Got it. Certainly better than when we started. <laughs> Well, it's a. It, I would say you filled an abyss. Okay. <laughs> there, there certainly is mystery, and mystery will continue, and that's okay. Uh, I think um, it's that kind of book that, you, whether you've taught it many times or read it many times, you you see new things, and it, it continues to open up. But re remember the name of the book: Unveiling, Revealing, Apocalypse. It's meant to continue this process of unveiling the good news. Don't expect to just have it all at once. How this book got into where did it travel from John mm. to um, how did it get? Well, so it began being, uh, I, I don't know exactly where it went, but it, it was read by the churches and and as the uh, early Christians began to form the scripture, so you know it, they all just started as different pieces in the New Testament um, until about the fourth century. There was considerable debate at the councils where they were establishing the canon, meaning what is holy scripture. There was debate about Revelation. Martin Luther wasn't the first, or Jerome wasn't the first. Um, and some, some thought, no, well, no, it's just a little too weird to go in. And some thought, well, no, if we understand the message. So coming out of the debate, it still was included and was placed last. I think appropriately last um, to sort of sum up how uh, uh, a hopeful ending for the whole of the story. Well, in your travels, do you find that it is preached much in the church uh, about that um, Jesus has won? And um, how, 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 when, how have you found that in today's society people are dealing with God in churches? Right. Um, it is used, it is either ignored pretty heavily, or it is preached to an extreme. And one reason it's ignored is sometimes because of, of the extremes, um, where, uh, and, and some are just, because there's so many different views, in, especially in Baptist life, I, I have a book that show it's an old book, but it shows the different views by different leading Baptists on um, just the idea of millennialism, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial in Baptist life. You know, and there was a day when we all agreed to disagree about Revelation, and and that wasn't a test of faith. It was just okay. You're a postmillennialist. You're a premillennialist. Whatever. You know, let's go on. Um, unfortunately, in a, as we get more and more polarized, sometimes that becomes uh, dividing points to where some would just say, uh, let's just not try to teach it or preach it because who knows what we might stir up. Yeah. But isn't that the whole purpose of the Bible? It's the ending. It is. I mean, is. they miss the whole thing. Right. I missed a lot till I heard you, right. but I'm, I just so I can't understand that. Yeah. Why in preaching it, or in talking to people, right. it's the end that you're hoping for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe this introduction helps, and and we can you can talk with friends and others about that, and uh, mm -hmm. and I, I would hope everyone can understand it's 
we don't all see Revelation the same way, and that's okay. Um, but if we can come out with the, the understanding of, you know, the, the battle is won, uh, uh, the war is won, the battle continues, God is victorious. That's a message of hopefulness. All right. Well, thank you for a great year. Uh, along the way, as I said earlier, I'll teach some shorter things <laughs> as needed as I can be helpful. Um, but um, uh, I appreciate your commitment to a whole year long journey. And thanks so much for, I'm going to call you good. <laughs> something. Look at this. <laughs> Pockets and everything. Thank you. <laughs> David, let me, ask you, let me ask you. I know you're an accomplished chef. <laughs> let me ask you, how do you crack an egg? How do I crack an egg? <laughs> well, not just with, with one hand, right? Uh, many, yeah, one hand. Uh -huh. How many hands? Let me reframe the question. But how many hands do you crack an egg? I do it with one. That's the correct way. Okay. We do. We do. We had a, an accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you remember, I'm just learning how to do this. With how many hands do you change better. the light bulb? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well known, prominent chef here in North Carolina, yes. Don Miller. Okay. And he taught me to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I cannot get anybody else in the family to do it. <laughs> so nobody else can crack eggs with me. Yeah. Well, I'm still learning. <laughs> Don't come over for dinner again, unless you're famous. <laughs> All right. Bye -bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.